Auditory Brainstem Response, Wikipedia Article Audio The auditory brainstem response is an auditory evoked potential extracted from ongoing electrical activity in the brain and recorded via electrodes placed on the scalp. The measured recording is a series of six to seven vertex positive waves of which I through V are evaluated. These waves, labeled with Roman numerals in Jewett and Williston Convention, occur in the first 10 milliseconds after onset of an auditory stimulus. The abridged is considered an exogenous response because it is dependent upon external factors. The auditory structures that generate the auditory brainstem response are believed to be as follows. History of research Measurement techniques In 1967, Zomer and Fien Messer were the first to publish ABRs recorded with surface electrodes in humans which showed that cochlear potentials could be obtained non-invasively. In 1971, Jewett and Williston gave a clear description of the human abridged and correctly interpreted the later waves as arriving from the brainstem. In 1977, Selters and Brackman published landmark findings on prolonged interpeak latencies in tumor cases. In 1974, Hecox and Galambos showed that the abridged could be used for threshold estimation in adults and infants. In 1975, Starr and Aker were the first to report the effects on the abridged of CNS pathology in the brainstem. When interpreting the abridged, we look at amplitude, latency, interpeak latency, and interaural latency. The abridged represents initiated activity beginning at the base of the cochlea and moving toward the apex over a 4 milliseconds period of time. The peaks largely reflect activity from the most basal regions on the cochlea because the disturbance hits the basal end first and by the time it gets to the apex, a significant amount of phase cancellation occurs. The abridged is used for newborn hearing screening, auditory threshold estimation, intraoperative monitoring, determining hearing loss type and degree, and auditory nerve and brainstem lesion detection, and in development of cochlear implants. One use of the traditional abridged is site of lesion testing and it has been shown to be sensitive to large acoustic tumors. However, it has poor sensitivity to tumors smaller than 1 cm in diameter. In the 1990s, there were several studies that concluded that the use of ABRs to detect acoustic tumors should be abandoned. As a result, Many practitioners only use MRI for this purpose now. The reason the abridged does not identify small tumors can be explained by the fact that ABRs rely on latency changes of peak V. Peak V is primarily influenced by high frequency fibers and tumors will be missed if those fibers aren't affected. Although the click stimulates a wide frequency region on the cochlea, Phase cancellation of the lower frequency responses occurs as a result of time delays along the basilar membrane. If a tumor is small, it is possible those fibers won't be sufficiently affected to be detected by the traditional abridged measure. Recording Parameters Primary reasons why it is not practical to simply send every patient in for an MRI are the high cost of an MRI its impact on patient comfort, and limited availability in rural areas and third world countries. In 1997, Dr. Manuel Don and colleagues published on the stacked abridged as a way to enhance the sensitivity of the abridged in detecting smaller tumors. Their hypothesis was that the new abridged stack derived band abridged amplitude could detect small acoustic tumors missed by standard abridged measures. In 2005, he stated that it would be clinically valuable to have available an abridged test to screen for small tumors. In a 2005 interview in Audiology Online, 
Dr. Don of House Ear Institute defined the stacked abridged as an attempt to record the sum of the neural activity across the entire frequency region of the cochlea in response to a click stimuli. The stacked abridged is the sum of the synchronous neural activity generated from five frequency regions across the cochlea in response to click stimulation and high-pass pink noise masking. The development of this technique was based on the eighth cranial nerve compound action potential work done by Tees, Eldridge, and Davis in 1962. Interpretation of Results the stacked abridged is a composite of activity from all frequency regions of the cochlea not just high frequency. When the derived waveforms are representing activity from more apical regions along the basilar membrane, wave V latencies are prolonged because of the nature of the traveling wave. In order to compensate for these latency shifts, the wave V component for each derived waveform is stacked added together, and then the resulting amplitude is measured. In 2005, Don explains that in a normal ear, the sum of the stacked abridged will have the same amplitude as the click evoked abridged. But, the presence of even a small tumor results in a reduction in the amplitude of the stacked abridged in comparison with the click evoked abridged. With the intent of screening for and detecting the presence of small acoustic tumors, the stacked abridged is Use Advanced Techniques In a 2007 comparative study of abridged abnormalities in acoustic tumor patients, Montaguti and colleagues mention the promise of and great scientific interest in the stacked abridged. The article suggests that the stacked abridged could make it possible to identify small acoustic neuromas missed by traditional ABRs. Stacked abridged The stacked abridged is a valuable screening tool for the detection of small acoustic tumors because it is sensitive, specific, widely available, comfortable, and cost-effective. Tone burst abridged is used to obtain thresholds for children who are too young to otherwise reliably respond behaviorally to frequency-specific sound stimuli. The most common frequencies tested at 500, 1000, 2000, and 4000 Hz, as these frequencies are generally thought to be necessary for hearing aid programming. History Auditory steady-state response is an auditory evoked potential, elicited with modulated tones that can be used to predict hearing sensitivity in patients of all ages. It is an electrophysiologic response to rapid auditory stimuli and creates a statistically valid estimated audiogram. The ASSR uses statistical measures to determine if and when a threshold is present and is a cross-check for verification purposes prior to arriving at a differential diagnosis. In 1981, Galambos and colleagues reported on the 40 Hz auditory potential which is a continuous 400 Hz tone sinusoidally amplitude modulated at 40 Hz and at 70 dB SPL. This produced a very frequency-specific response, but the response was very susceptible to state of arousal. In 1991, Cohen and colleagues learned that by presenting at a higher rate of stimulation than 40 Hz, the response was smaller but less affected by sleep. In 1994, Rick Arts and colleagues showed that it was possible to obtain responses in newborns. In 1995, Linz and Picton found that simultaneous stimuli presented at rates in the 80 to 100 Hz range made it possible to obtain auditory thresholds. The same or similar to traditional recording montages used for abridged recordings are used for the ASSR. Two active electrodes are placed at or near vertex and at ipsilateral earlobe slash mastoid with ground at low forehead. If collecting from both ears simultaneously, a two-channel preamplifier is used. 
When single channel recording system is used to detect activity from a binaural presentation, a common reference electrode may be located at the nape of the neck. Transducers can be insert earphones, headphones, a bone oscillator, or sound field and it is preferable if patient is asleep. Unlike abridged settings, the high-pass filter might be approximately 40 to 90 Hz and low-pass filter might be between 320 and 720 Hz with typical filter slopes of 6 dB per octave. Gain settings of 10,000 are common, artifact reject is left on, and it is thought to be advantageous to have manual override to allow the clinician to make decisions during test and apply course corrections as needed. Similarities Differences Stacked abridged defined Analysis is mathematically based and dependent upon the fact that related bioelectric events coincide with the stimulus rep rate. The specific method of analysis is based on the manufacturer's statistical detection algorithm. It occurs in the spectral domain and is composed of specific frequency components that are harmonics of the stimulus repetition rate. Early ASSR systems considered the first harmonic only, but newer systems also incorporate higher harmonics in their detection algorithms. Most equipment provides correction tables for converting ASSR thresholds to estimated HL audiograms and are found to be within 10 dB to 15 dB of audiometric thresholds. Although there are variances across studies, correction data depends on variables such as equipment used, frequencies collected, collection time, age of subject, sleep state of subject. Stimulus Parameters Methodology In certain cases where behavioral thresholds cannot be attained, abridged thresholds can be used for hearing aid fittings. New fitting formulas such as DSLV 5.0 allow the user to base the settings in the hearing aid on the abridged thresholds. Correction factors do exist for converting abridged thresholds to behavioral thresholds, but vary greatly. For example, one set of correction factors involves lowering abridged thresholds from 1000-4000 Hz by 10 dB and lowering the abridged threshold at 500 Hz by 15-20 to 20 dB. Previously, Brainstem audiometry has been used for hearing aid selection by using normal and pathological intensity amplitude functions to determine appropriate amplification. The principal idea of the selection and fitting of the hearing instrument was based on the assumption that amplitudes of the brainstem potentials were directly related to loudness perception. Under this assumption, the amplitudes of brainstem potentials stimulated by the hearing devices should exhibit close to normal values. Abridged thresholds do not necessarily improve in the aided condition. Abridged can be an inaccurate indicator of hearing aid benefit due to difficulty processing the appropriate amount of fidelity of the transient stimuli used to evoke a response. Bone conduction abridged thresholds can be used if other limitations are present, but thresholds are not as accurate as abridged thresholds recorded through air conduction. Wave I through 3 generated by the auditory branch of cranial nerve 8 and lower, wave 4 and V generated by the upper brainstem, more in-depth location wave I originates from the dendrites of the auditory nerve fibers. Wave 2 from the cochlear nucleus, 3 showing activity in the superior olivary complex, and wave 4 V associated with the lateral lemniscus. Advantages of hearing aid selection by brainstem audiometry include the following applications. Disadvantages of hearing aid selection by brainstem audiometry include the following applications. Step 1 Obtain click evoked abridged responses to clicks and high pass pink masking noise. Step 2. Obtain derived band ABRs. 
Step 3, shift and align the wave V peaks of the DBR thus, stacking the waveforms with wave V lined up. Step 4, add the waveforms together. Step 5, compare the amplitude of the stacked abridged with the click evoked abridged from the same ear. There are about 188,000 people around the world who have received cochlear implants. In the United States alone, there are about 30,000 adults and over 30,000 children who are recipients of cochlear implants. This number continues to grow as cochlear implantation is becoming more and more accepted. In 1961, Dr. William House began work on the predecessor for today's cochlear implant. William House is an otologist and is the founder of House Ear Institute in Los Angeles, California. This groundbreaking device, which was manufactured by 3M Company was approved by the FDA in 1984. Although this was a single-channel device, it paved the way for future multi-channel cochlear implants. Currently, as of 2007, the three cochlear implant devices approved for use in the U.S. are manufactured by Cochlear, Med-L, and Advanced Bionics. The way a cochlear implant works as sound is received by the cochlear implant's microphone which picks up input that needs to be processed to determine how the electrodes will receive the signal. This is done on the external component of the cochlear implant called the sound processor. The transmitting coil, also an external component transmits the information from the speech processor through the skin using frequency modulated radio waves. The signal is never turned back into an acoustic stimulus unlike a hearing aid. This information is then received by the cochlear implant's internal components. The receiver stimulator delivers the correct amount of electrical stimulation to the appropriate electrodes on the array to represent the sound signal that was detected. The electrode array stimulates the remaining auditory nerve fibers in the cochlea, which carry the signal onto the brain, where it is processed. Application and Effectiveness Tone Burst Abridged Auditory Steady State Response ASSR Defined One way to measure the developmental status and limits of plasticity of the auditory cortical pathways is to study the latency of cortical auditory evoked potentials. In particular, the latency of the first positive peak of the CAEP is of interest to researchers. P1 in children is considered a marker for maturation of the auditory cortical areas. The P1 is a robust positive wave occurring at around 100 to 300 milliseconds in children. P1 latency represents the synaptic delays throughout the peripheral and central auditory pathways. 95% sensitivity, 83% specificity. P1 latency changes as a function of age, and is considered an index of cortical auditory maturation. P1 latency and age has a strong negative correlation, decrease in P1 latency with increasing age. This is most likely due to more efficient synaptic transmission over time. The P1 waveform also becomes broader as we age. The P1 neural generators are thought to originate from the thalamocortical portion of the auditory cortex. Researchers believe that P1 may be the first recurrent activity in the auditory cortex. The negative component following P1 is called N1. N1 is not consistently seen in children until 12 years or age. In 2006 Sharma and Dorman measured the P1 response in deaf children who received cochlear implants at different ages to examine the limits of plasticity in the central auditory system. Those who received cochlear implant stimulation in early childhood had normal P1 latencies. 
Children who received cochlear implant stimulation late in childhood had abnormal cortical responses latencies. However, children who received cochlear implant stimulation between the ages 3.5 and 7 years revealed variable latencies of the P1. Sharma also studied the waveform morphology of the P1 response in 2005 and 2007. She found that in early implanted children the P1 waveform morphology was normal. For late implanted children, the P1 waveforms were abnormal and had lower amplitudes when compared to normal waveform morphology. In 2008 Gilly and colleagues used source reconstruction and dipole source analysis derived from high-density EEG recordings to estimate generators for the P1 in three groups of children, normal hearing children, children receiving a cochlear implant before the age of 4, and children receiving a cochlear implant after the age of 7. Findings concluded that the waveform morphology of normal hearing children and early implanted children were very similar. To achieve the highest quality recordings for any recording potential, good patient relaxation is generally necessary. However, many recordings can be filled and contaminated with myogenic and movement artifacts. Patient restlessness and movement will contribute to threshold overestimation and inaccurate test results. In most cases, an adult is usually more than capable to provide a good extratympanic recording. In transtympanic recordings, a sedative can be used when time-consuming events need to take place. Most patients are given light anesthesia when test transtympanically. Both record bioelectric activity from electrodes arranged in similar recording arrays, both are auditory evoked potentials, both use acoustic stimuli delivered through inserts, both can be used to estimate threshold for patients who cannot or will not participate in traditional behavioral measures. Chloral hydrate is a commonly prescribed sedative and most common for inducing sleep in young children and infants for AEP recordings. It uses alcohol to depress the central nervous system, specifically the cerebral cortex. Side effects of chloral hydrate include vomiting, nausea, gastric irritation, delirium, disorientation, allergic reactions and occasionally excitement a high level of activity rather than becoming tired and falling asleep. Chloral hydrate is readily available in three forms syrup, capsule, and suppository. Syrup is most successful for those four months and older, proper dosage is poured in an oral syringe or cup. The syringe is used to squirt in the back of the mouth and then the child is encouraged to swallow. To induce sleep, dosages range anywhere from 500 mg to 2 g, the recommended pediatric dose is equal to 50 mg per kg of body weight. A second dose no greater than the first dose, and an overall dose not exceeding 100 mg kg of body weight can be used if the child does not fall asleep after the first dose. Sedation personnel should include a physician and a registered or practical nurse. Documentation and monitoring of physiologic parameters is required throughout the entire process. Sedatives should only be administered in the presence of those who are knowledgeable and skilled in airway management and cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Increasingly, Propofol is used intravenously via infusion pump for sedation. A consent form must be signed and received from the patient or guardian indicating the conscious sedation and the procedure being performed. Documented medical evaluation for pre-sedation purposes including a focused airway examination either on the same day as the sedation process or within recent days that will include but not limited to. History 2 All orders for conscious sedation for patients must be written. 
Prescriptions or orders received from areas outside of the conscious sedation area are not acceptable. There has to be a single individual assigned to monitor the sedated patient's cardiorespiratory status before, during and after sedation. If patient is deeply sedated, the individual's only job should be to verify and record vital signs no less than every five minutes. All age and size appropriate equipment and medications used to sustain life should be verified before sedation and should be readily available at any time during and after sedation. The medication should be administered by a physician or nurse and documented. Children should not receive the sedative without supervision of a skilled and knowledgeable medical personnel. Emergency equipment including crash cart must be readily available and respiration monitoring should be done visually or with stethoscope. Family member needs to remain in room with patient, especially if tester steps out. In this scenario, respiration can be monitored acoustically with a talkback system microphone placed near patient's head. Medical personnel should be notified of slow respiration state. Methodology 2 V.S. A.S.S.R. Analysis, Normative Data, and General Trends After procedure is over, patient must be continuously observed in the facility that is appropriately equipped and staffed because patients typically floppy and have poor motor control. Patients shouldn't stand on their own for the first few hours. No other medications with alcohol should be administered until patient is back to normal state. Drinking fluids is encouraged to reduce stomach irritation. Each facility should create and use their own discharge criteria. Verbal and written instructions should be provided on the topics of limitations of activity and anticipated changes in behavior. All discharge criteria must be met and documented before the patient leaves the facility. Some criteria prior to discharge should include Hearing aid fittings Cochlear implantation and central auditory development Sedation protocols Common sedative used Procedures ASSR looks at amplitude and phases in the spectral domain rather than at amplitude and latency. ASSR depends on peak detection across a spectrum rather than across a time versus amplitude waveform. ASSR is evoked using repeated sound stimuli presented at a high rep rate rather than an abrupt sound at a relatively low rep rate. A bridge typically uses click or tone burst stimuli in one ear at a time but ASSR can be used binaurally while evaluating broadbands or four frequencies simultaneously, abridged. Estimates thresholds basically from 1-4K in typical mild-moderate severe hearing losses. ASSR can also estimate thresholds in the same range but offers more frequency-specific info more quickly and can estimate hearing in the severe to profound hearing loss ranges. Abridged depends highly upon a subjective analysis of the amplitude-slash-latency function. The ASSR uses a statistical analysis of the probability of a response. Abridged is measured in microvolts and the ASSR is measured in nanovolts. Evaluation of loudness perception in the dynamic range of hearing, determination of basic hearing aid properties, cases with middle ear impairment, non-cooperative subjects even in sleep, sedation or anesthesia without influence of age and vigilance. In cases of severe hearing impairment including no OR only poor information as to loudness perception, no control of compression setting, no frequency-specific compensation of hearing impairment. Age and weight, a complete and thorough medical history including all current medications, drug allergies, relevant disease, adverse drug reactions and all relevant family history, 
verify any airway or respiratory problems, all medications taken on the day of the procedure, food and fluid intake within the 8 hours prior to sedation light breakfast or lunch 1-2 hours prior to testing reduces likelihood of gastric irritation, all vital signs. Stable vital signs similar to those taken pre-procedure, patient is at the level of consciousness pre-procedure, patient has received post-procedure care instructions.